saw the Jolly Roger flying. Ooh, that piqued my interest, so I went over. I ask somebody, well, what is this? It's a very scary looking sticker. And they tell me, oh, this is Sea Shepherd. They fight illegal whaling, illegal fishing. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Pirates? Yeah. Pirates. Well, you know, the pirate thing we've kind of adopted because we were called pirates for so long. But, um, we're really not pirates. The world is changing, our tactics are changing. Now we are working a lot together with governments. It's about time for them to wake up. Like, I'm sure they've all seen what's happened in Europe. Our fish is gone, the Atlantic is empty, the cod collapsed, there is just nothing to catch. And now the European fleet is here. East Africa is already in a very bad state, like the mega trawlers have been there, they still are just emptying the oceans. If you look at the situation in Somalia, the so pirates can be argued that they used to be fishermen, but then foreign trawlers came, took the fish, they have no income. So I think it's just common sense that the countries are waking up. de l'opération Albarcor 2, le domaine maritime gabonais en plein cœur du golfe de Guinée, est aujourd'hui menacé par la pêche illicite non déclarée et non réglementée par la piraterie maritime, notamment du fait de ses ressources pétrolières et minières. We check the chamber to make sure there is no bullet in the chamber. And 
So when they're stalled, they are safe, there are no bullet. And then when we give them, we check the chamber again. And when they come back, we check the chamber, so we make sure that when they're stored, there is no bullet in it. And ammo and guns are stored separately. So, so 1950, she was built as a whaling ship, and the harpooning deck used to be over here. This would be where the harpoon slits on. And I think that's the sweetest thing. It used to kill whales, now it's protecting them. <laughs> Sea Shepherd defending um, the whales in the Southern Ocean. So Japanese uh, whalers go down there to hunt the whales, and Sea Shepherd was the only one who went down there. It the most impressive story was how Sea Shepherd stood up to that and got in between, you know, the harpoon ships and the uh, processing ships and prevented him from being able to transfer any whales onto the processing ship. I've been there in the small boats next to the harpoon ships and it's, yeah, it's scary, it's different. But then again, throwing paint bombs versus physically stopping illegal fishing vessels, taking them out of the action, you save millions, hundreds of thousands of lives. Very, very close to the whaling fleet, and we would physically block them from transferring dead whales. We would physically stop them with uh, putting defensive lines into the water, throwing uh, stink bombs into their decks, throwing paint into them to symbolize the bloody business that they are doing. And I think the most impressive the campaign called Zero Tolerance. This is the Nishimaru, the whaling factory vessel. Factory ship, fuel tanker. And to come together, they need to get fuel. And this is what we did for five days. One of our ships was here in between. Our interest was to stop this refueling operation because if they cannot have fuel, they won't be able to continue waiting. To refuel at sea, two ships need to come together like this. So the Nishimaru tried to come alongside the fuel tanker, and we had our ships go there in between them to stop them from physically touching for five days. We were stopping it and that situation got really, really tense. Nishimaru was shooting water down to the Bob Barker's engine room. So the Bob Barker lost all steering, lost all engines. It started to keel like this. Bob Barker's captain, the extremely brave, Peter Hammerstein was shouting, Mayday, 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 Bob Barker, stop, Bob Barker, stop, I have no engines. And only then the Nishimaru pulled away. And before that, they had already crushed the main masts of the Bob Barker, crushed the heli deck. So that the Bob Barker, thank God, him didn't sink. But it was, yeah, it was very, very close. Now, after this, we had the injunction come against our ships that we cannot go 500 meters close to the... This is an injunction from a U.S. court, and that's the weird thing. How can the U.S. court have jurisdiction in international waters to a crew that is international to a ship that's flagged to Netherlands? But still, we are respecting this injunction because we do not engage in illegal activities. Uh, this flag? Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we don't use it in Africa because there is a piracy situation and it's just not very tactful and politically correct to fly a pirate flag. Of course, part of me 
always looks back to these days and the successes that we had, like zero tolerance saved the life of 700 whales. Of course, you always look back to it, to the people who you work with, to these accomplishments and think, ah, oh, that was nice. But then I'm also extremely happy with the direction Sea Shepherd has taken. Because for me personally, IUU fishing and overfishing has been my thing. I've always hoped like, ah, oh, I hope we would do more for the fish because the fish, they don't scream when they die and nobody knows what's going on with them. Like they are the underlings of the planet in a way. So for me to see this collaboration with governments, putting more uh, work into protection of fish, it's just a dream come true really. to the port it's going as quickly as possible, unload the frozen food and return. Um, but just to sit offshore with a bunch of frozen food, it's a bit strange. It's just suspicious. Uh, suspicious okay. actually. It's huge. We don't know what's the cargo. And it's a funny vessel because it's like a traditional reefer where they have the cargo hatches that you can go fix out. But then it can also carry containers of it. So it has holes in cargo. Yeah. Wild Lotus, Wild Lotus, Wild Lotus. This is Gavinese Navy Patrol Vessel, Hopper Starboard D. Wild Lotus, channel 1 6. Wild Lotus, 3 point. Good afternoon, Wild Lotus. This is uh, Gavinese Fisheries and Navy, Hopper Starboard D. Uh, we've noticed you've been drifting inside the Gavinese EEZ for several days. Uh, wondering uh, what your, your intentions were here or? Inspect to make sure your freezers are empty, that's all. What is your flag? What is your nationality of your vessel? Uh, the ship is Dutch flag, it's under loan to the Japanese government. Okay, I understand. That's what I thought. réfrigérant, un reefer de 150 mètres de long. C'est un bateau qui s'utilise pour faire du transbordement de poissons. Euh, donc, euh, voilà. euh, pour l'instant, ils ont l'air plutôt coopératifs. Vous avez un nombre de passagers à bord Non. Et ils se sont déjà rassemblés euh, plage avant, plage arrière Non plus. Vous demandez. Can you ask the Bob if we have an idea of how many crew there are on the ship Ja, 
madame. Euh, là. Il est en transit, il revient du Gola, il est en train de partir à Douane du Sud, en Afrique du Sud. Il est en train de transporter des fruits. Il y a des autres territoires. 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 Il y a But you tell him for... Uh, yeah, I tell him about this is on the gun, it's not possible. Not there, not there, my friend. Because it's early for us now, we yeah. so have to drift it and clean holes for preparation for next cargo. This vessel cannot make him turn ship and operation. For me, explanation from your Navy should say it's any prohibited transshipment operation. But believe me, vessel with crane in open sea with this way. This is not possible. Need different cargo gear, Derek. You understand me, Derek? Mm -hmm. These two Derek is two wires. Ground have one wires. Just only one point of pivot point. Yeah. This is problem. This is not possible to work. Just drifting in safe position. Take your time. Okay. For okay. in okay. time coming. Because okay. in Durban, not possible for this vessel okay. stay on anchorage. Because okay. too much wave and swell. Okay. 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 different and it's it's nice to have the government on board and be able to uh, actually stop the, the fish and inspect what's going on so it's a different experience but it's, it's a good usually one. Usually government don't like you. Yeah usually that's the case <laughs> yeah usually we go to like the pharaohs and they say get out you know or uh, um, yeah that, that place they don't like us very much at all so. And the pharaohs, because we don't want them to kill the pilot whales. And so, you know, they have this long tradition of driving the pilot whales with their small boats and driving them up onto the beach and killing them on the beach. Um, and so we've gone there and, and, and interfered with the hunts there, which uh, is, you know, there's, there's a whole layers of legal issues there because it is illegal for the EU to hunt whales. And the pharaohs are ostensibly part of the EU, but they claim that they're not. tried uh, in years past to pass laws against us and they kept getting uh, they weren't they, the way they were worded they wouldn't enforce them um, so and I think believe this year they they have succeeded in, in keeping us from going there I know the ships can't go in um, 
I don't know if individuals want now how that would work out, but uh, we're not going there uh, on a campaign this year because of that, because of the prohibition there. And then we have other issues now that we're tackling, like this illegal fishing, which is a huge problem all over the world. If you want to eat tuna, for example, you just go to the supermarket, buy a can of tuna, open it, and you enjoy it because you like the taste. But when you see how it's catched, you start to think about it. These big fishing boats called Persena fish they are already in a big trap. You know, they cannot go out, but there's still plenty of space, several hundred meters. And then the Persena boat starts to um, pull in the nets. And the net, the circle, is getting tighter and tighter. Fish are squeezed out like a lemon. And the, in this moment, the, the sea really turns red full of blood. It's just a sea of blood. Another net, it's called a scoop with a metal ring, just go, they go into the big net and scoop out the fish. One time we, we have been around this procedure, but we counted 15 scoops. When you say five ton each, for example, yeah, that's one catch of it. 75 tons of tuna, and they do it several times a day, almost every day, with a big fleet. So now you get an idea why the ocean is overfished. Since that our friend uh, stopped now, so I guess they they shoot down and, and got a catch. Then it turned around, and here you can see it in two circles. So usually when they find fish, they, they shoot down and they do a circle. When they do it, then it starts to get some stuff. It could be an interesting target for us. Have any weapons or guns on board over? No, no, no firearms, nothing on board. of uh, tuna fishing by the European industrial persainer fleet. They have been fishing here quite extensively since the 1950s as well. So that has also led to the fact that there is not so much tuna left. So that is why Gabon and other nations in this region are doing these inspections to make sure that they have the amount of catch on board that they are reporting. Like you see, today, free school, 15 yeah. tons. Fat set is a raft, eight, 10 tons. Two yellowfin, 8 tons skip So it's what you fish from the FADs? Yeah. 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 And you buy a catch? Yeah, turtle, shark. No, yeah, it's shark, but you release the world alive. Yeah. So far, alive. Five sharks on the whole trip? In this world? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you reported this bycatch? Yeah. 
Thank you. 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 My main goal will be about bycatch and the IUU, the illegal, unregulated and underreported fishing that is happening in the West African region. Um, because it is estimated that between 11 and 26 million tons of fish is being caught illegally. 7.3 million tons of fish are being discarded as bycatch annually. It's just being killed without being targeted. Here you can see the net. In the net you can see a lot of dead sharks because the problem with the sharks is since they're lacking a swim ladder, when they lift up the net, already before the net is on the deck, the sharks die because of lack of oxygen and because they do not have a swim ladder. So if they don't move, they will die immediately. Last year when we were here in Gabon, we also had several cases of whale sharks getting caught in the net with the purseiners. So on several occasions we had to cut up the net to be able to save the whale sharks and uh, release this from the entanglement in the net. And that is also a beautiful feeling when you see the whale sharks swimming away from the net. shark when I was three years old, so it's a long story with the sharks. For me the most difficult and impressive it was when I saw my first day shark for the first patrol, it was yeah, horrible, because I didn't see shark dead before, so it was the first time I had, so it was yeah, horrible. But my motivation was stronger after that, because I knew that I wanted to be there again and continue, but it was yeah, horrible. So are you guys expecting me to change it? To start on my watch, or do I just leave it there? Uh, I'll have a look at it and see. Yeah, it, it should get pretty cool. And then... What I wanted to do is help. Do you know that you're helping the world be a bit better? So I would say that that would be, to me, one of the things that has impressed me the most is how you get the energy from wherever you need to get it, but you do it. I wanted to do something for Earth. When I came on board, it was my first time at sea. It was my first time in the galley as well. So I had a lot to learn. This is the seventh campaign. I just love it. I just love it. <laughs> I love being on the ship. I love um, the crew. I, I just love the, the whole thing. And being at sea, I, I feel more at home on a ship at sea than I do on land, for sure. <laughs> So after I spent uh, 45 years in the Navy, I retired in uh, summer 2016, so one year ago. And after a while, I started missing going at sea. But I didn't want to uh, just go at sea for fun, because I do have a sailing boat. But I needed a mission. Uh, Did you go the mess that we have made? Oh, boy. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Two whales jumping. Yeah in the air completely and no at the same one. time. Two of them reached together. Yeah. It's there there again!
platforms that float in the water and then the FAD trails underneath water attracting fish but this one does not have a float in it so it's just floating freely which is an entanglement risk for whales and obviously for ships because now it's stuck to our ship and of course it's rubbish at this stage we cannot leave it in the ocean because maybe a shark or fish or dolphin get entangled there or another vessel it'll go into the propeller so we're gonna Can you pull it up a little bit or is it super, it's super heavy? Okay. Now, then it continues for a bit. Then it goes further under. What about getting one set of scuba? These two are two different devices that this black float is from a local fisherman's net because I've seen this before a lot in the coast of Africa. Usually they would have a little net attached to that but now we are 30 miles away from the coast and the local wooden boats they don't really come this far so it's probably been torn out by a storm or strong winds or tide and just drifted far out and this FAD is definitely for a persainer. So we got very lucky that it didn't get stuck in our propeller or any other vital parts of the ship or it wasn't a shark or a dolphin or a whale getting stuck. A little adventure <laughs> for the evening, exactly. <laughs> of our people are volunteers. At dinner, at lunch, you'll see everybody here. Captain next to a deckhand, next to a second pool, playing cards. And of course, if we are willing to protect the whales, the sharks, the dolphins, the fish, we don't want them to be killed. Why would we eat animal products here? All of our ships, the whole fleet, we now have 10 ships. All of them are vegan. And also anything that goes into the water with our shower water has to be marine safe. So all the soaps, shampoos, laundry detergent, everything, we choose them very wisely. So they are marine safe and also vegan and not tested on animals. Uh, we dropped the Navy uh, on one vessel, the uh, vessel, the, the Bob Barker, was going to try to uh, ask the other fishing vessel to stop, and we will go right after when we're done, we'll go to this one and try to have it stop as well, so to try to stop three of them, they cross the border. Ah. 
vessel it was before we had a visual on them uh-huh. although their behavior on radar looked very similar to what we've seen in the past for trawlers we are navy on two boats and a third one tried to manage to run away because uh, we were busy with the two other boats this year those two uh, vessel are the first arrest we are doing
this is like my first one of working with the government, having the soldiers on board and all. It's the first time with that, so that's completely different. Um, usually we have no real way of enforcing our authority. You know, we have authority from the United Nations Charter for Nature. That's about it. look at any fishery in, in the world right now and there none of them are going up they're all either stable which is a few that are stable most of them are in decline the methods of fishing are so efficient now that there's no way that the, the fish can sustain and replenish governments have to wake up countries have to wake up and that's happening especially in africa where we have now a multitude of nations that are willing to work with us and inviting us to come into their waters to protect them. When you fish in an unsustainable way, you are taking more fish out of the ocean than what there is left to reproduce. You are taking the young fish who still haven't made babies, you're taking whole schools of fish. Let's say they have a license to catch tuna. You will never catch only tuna. And anything in the net that it's not tuna, they are supposed to throw it back to the sea alive. But it happens very rarely. They are crushed together. They are already bleeding and they are already dead. So it's just very, very hard for them to return the fish to the sea alive. Already estimates are saying that by 19, uh, 2050, the level of how much fish there is is below the overall threshold that the fish cannot repopulate anymore. The stocks cannot raise to a level where there will be fish left for the future generations. And already the levels of the big top fish in the food chain, the shark, the tuna, all these big fish, if, like some scientists say that bluefin tuna, which is a top predator in the Mediterranean, already 90% of it are gone and it won't recover. Already some estimates say that 90% of the sharks are gone and can they raise up to the levels where they used to be? It's very, very uh, much up to debate. All the treasures that we have around us are on the verge of uh, disappearing. And we already could see that happening here in the, in the Atlantic, in, in front of the western coast of, uh, of Africa, uh, where used to be tons and tons of fish in big size. And now we have, we've seen these fishermen, that are, they are in their nets, you can see very small, tiny fishes that could never be of any interest to a a normal fisherman. So I didn't expect the situation to be so bad. that they will definitely not use. So the jellyfish and the fish. We saw this really big eel in the corner. He started to move. Everybody was surprised in this moment because no one expected that. It was really like, he wanted to say, hey, here, here I am. Yeah, the Chinese fisherman came and took the eel and uh, he threw it overboard back into the water. So. And we could see that the eel survived, he just started to move again and he disappeared in the water. So these are the small stories that reminds you, hey, keep on trying, try harder. And I mean, if the eel wouldn't have moved and 
moved right in all the way to in front of our feet. Hey, he, would, he would just be one another dead fish on board. So it was yeah a little reminder that you have to to continue fighting. I think it's not just what the single ships are doing that, is, that will make the difference. Even one ship makes the difference because it's a message. And we have to understand we cannot stay still and, and just uh, be witness of the, this, the ongoing disaster. There are people who view this as an adventure because going to sea, it's, it's not a normal thing unless you are a working sailor. <coughs> it can be this romantical adventure, going off and saving the whales and dolphins, but for me it's not that. For me it's something that I feel it's the only way of living on this planet, doing something where I actually make the place better. Because I want the, the future world to, the future generations to have a, an, enjoy the ocean how we have. In 20 years, when you um, when you're with your with your kid or your grandson and you see a whale, you know, jumping around in, in on the coast, you're gonna say, oh, no, I knew a guy that you know dropped everything and, and, and went and helped you know, put his little grain of sand to help that. Do I think that people can change the world? As in general, oh, absolutely. It shows you here, come onto a ship on Sea Shepherd, you don't have just one country. You have numerous different countries coming together for one goal. It does change, but I think we're all still fighting for the same thing in the end, you know, fighting for the oceans and the life in the oceans. So whether you do it romantically or efficiently is uh, semantics, right? <laughs>